Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greg Orton. I'm the National Director of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. Thank you so much for joining us today to have a wonderful conversation around the importance of API appointees in the Biden administration. We have some wonderful panelists with us, but a little bit about myself and NCAPA. NCAPA is the National Umbrella Coalition of 37 of the largest Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander civil rights organizations around the country. And, you know, one story to sort of start us off is, you know, last year in 2020, we decided to create a campaign called hashtag API 2020 because we figured, hey, we could all rally around a single cry. Maybe it'll be a little bit more effective. And it was a little bit of a social media experiment that took on a life of its own. And so we, we realized with its success, we wanted to do something new with 2021. And so we landed on hashtag who we are. And really the impetus of this was is if I'm being honest, I'm tired of us being ignored and invisibilized by media, by policymakers and everybody else. And so we thought, you know, it's time that we reclaim the narrative around who we are as a community. And so we'll talk about that more a little bit later, but again, it's hashtag who we are. Encourage everybody to use it. It's not in Kappa's by any means, it's really all of ours. Um, so with that, I will uh, turn it now over to my colleague, Madeline. Thank you, Greg. I'm Madeline Milka, President and CEO of APAX, the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies. Um, we were founded 26 years ago by former Secretary Norm Mineta when he was a member of Congress. And at the same time, he founded the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, KPAC, which consists of all of the Asian American Pacific Islander members of Congress um, in the US House and Senate. Um, right now, um, our job is to make sure that we have uh, representation at all levels of government um, and throughout the political process. And we are so excited that we have a record number of 21 Asian American Pacific Islander members of Congress, um, which is an increase from last, um, the last Congress. Um, and our work is really meant to be sure that the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is uh, seen um, throughout uh, all sorts of representation, whether it's boards and commissions, whether it is staffing, and whether it is our elected leaders. And so um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today as we talk about um, executive appointments. And um, I'm going to toss it over to my colleague, Karthik. Great. Thank you, Madeline. I'm Karthik Ramakrishnan. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I am a professor of public policy at UC Riverside, and I'm also the founder and director of API Data which publishes uh, demographic data and policy research on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. The work that we do is in partnership with community and many of the uh, organizations that are joining us today uh, in this webinar, uh, as well as uh, or organizations like APAX and Kappa Health Forum and so many others. Um, we truly believe in the power of collective impact when it comes to making sure that we advance not only our data equity goals, but also narrative for strategic action. We have a framework that we developed uh, at the center that I run for a few years now called DNA, which is data, narrative, and action. And I think that's uh, in a nutshell, um, what uh, a big part of advancing uh, an Asian American and Pacific Islander agenda has been uh, over the decades uh, and really honored to be here with all of you. Uh, I'll be serving as the MC and moderator today. Um, I would ask, we ask folks to Use the Q&A uh, function if they want to ask any questions uh, to be addressed by the panelists uh, and, uh, and not to use the chat function um, to do so. This is to ensure that we are able to see your questions and are able to answer them. Um, also, uh, encourage you to use the who we are hashtag as, as Greg noted. I was just talking to a reporter today uh, about still, I mean, maddeningly still, that here we are in 2021 and still trying to explain where Asian Americans fit in the American racial order. Um, so this is work that is just constant um, and, uh, and, and kudos to Greg and the rest of the coalition at NCAPA for continuing to push that social media um, agenda setting and narrative um, campaign. In addition to Greg and Madeline, we have Kathy Cochin and you might recognize Kathy uh, from her various other roles, but today, her affiliation, just less than a week old, is as CEO of Jasper Inclusion Advisors, which advises on philanthropic strategy. Through 2020, Kathy served as president and CEO of the Asian and Pacific Islander Health Forum for over a decade. As a leader in Asian American communities and working closely with Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities, her networks, her networks stretch across 35 states and the Pacific. 
From 2014 to 2017, she was a member of President Obama's Advisory Commission on AAPIs. Welcome back, Kathy. You had a little bit of a break, and thank you so much for jumping right into this after your very brief vacation. You're back at work already. Okay, Thanks, so, man. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so first I'm gonna toss a question over to Madeline. Madeline, there are a number of Asian American nominees requiring Senate confirmation. Can you just table set for us? Can you mention some of the more prominent names and what are the different agencies? Um, and can you say a little bit more about, you know, there's, there was a fair amount of, um, I guess, angst or concern about cabinet secretary appointments as opposed to other types of executive appointments uh, that are high profile and, and influential. So can you just walk us through the kind of one-on-one on who these folks are and what are the kind of agencies and, and how it relates to this notion of a cabinet? Absolutely. So uh, in terms of the cabinet, um, there are core agencies. Um, there is you know, written out um, sort of the line of succession according to those cabinet um, agencies as well when you think about President, Vice President, and then um, you know, in the line of succession, you know, speaker and you know, majority leader, and so you know, those agencies also play a role. There's, they also are the designated survivor. Um, so, if government were to be eradicated, there's always at least one member of the cabinet that is considered the designated survivor and is um, set aside from um, the rest of government, so that there is continuity in the government should there ever be an incident to where all of our um, government officials are no longer with us. And so um, a cabinet secretary has this ability to actually lead policy um, in coordination and leadership um, with the administration. And so um, when you think about that, I, I tend to think of our founder and Apex founder, um, Normanetta, having been the very first Asian American cabinet secretary. Um, he served um, under President Clinton in commerce and then continued on at President Bush's cabinet, serving in the transportation um, cabinet secretary role. Uh, I like to think of the fact that because of his presence, um, there was a lot of education um, around his background. Having been incarcerated as a young child in the internment camp, he was able to express his lived experience to President Bush. And after 9-11, um, President Bush um, took that and in, in noticed how he did not want to have anyone go through any similar uh, challenges as Norm did um, when you think about uh, you know, the constituencies that were being profiled and attacked um, after 9-11. So I think having been a part of the cabinet can become very much um, a, a voice for our community when you talk about representation. So the cabinet level uh, uh, appointees or nominees, um, you know, Neera Tandon um, at OMB, um, Julie Su um, at Labor, um, Catherine Tai at USTR, um, Uzra Sayra over at the Department of State, uh, Rohit Chopra over at Con the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. These are all um, different uh, uh, positions, but the cabinet level ones that we are looking at specifically would be um, Catherine Tai and Neera Tandon. And they are um, important because they are um, sometimes invited to cabinet meetings and are there um, to you know, voice their work as leaders within their um, agencies, um, but they are not cabinet secretaries. And again, going back to the line of secession, going back to designated survivor, there is so much history when it comes to being a part of a president's cabinet. And so um, levels of responsibility are very much um, different. And you know, I'm just going to use the words that you know, over a hundred um, congressional members used when they wrote a letter to the Biden administration when he filled the first 12 cabinet seats, um, none of them being in API, in Asian American, um, and said close to equal is not equal. Great, thank you, Madeline. Uh, next, I have a question for Greg. Um, Greg, you're the national director of NCAPA and you've spent a lot of years on Capitol Hill. Um, and, you know, we have people joining us from around the country here who might not be aware of all the intricacies of the Beltway, right? So many of us, when we think about representation, we think about members of Congress, right? Madeline said it started off as, and it's still called the APA Institute of Congressional Studies, but now representation is so much bigger than that. How can we think about representation, not only involving the president and vice president that are elected in the executive branch, 
but all of the other executive agencies, right? And so can you walk us through some of the things like rulemaking, budget, policy implementation? I mean, if, if I'm a community member in a particular state and I care intensely about an issue, what, what good might engaging directly with an executive agency get me? Yeah, I'm gonna do my best to not get super excited as a policy wonk here, um, but really agencies, rulemaking and all of that, that's everything. You know, we as community advocates oftentimes really focus on policy change. And that means lobbying Congress or creating legislative proposals to help, you know, uplift our communities or give them access to programs. But that access to programs really hinges on the administration and the implementation of the laws that Congress passes. You know, every once in a while in Congress, we'll, they'll pass something that we're excited about, but that's only half the battle, right? Once a law is passed and signed into law, uh, responsibility then falls on the federal government to implement that law. And so much work is required to make sure that implementation is done in a culturally sensitive way um, that centers our communities. And we've seen many, many times where that doesn't happen. I think a, a more contemporary example of where a law is passed and then implementation falls short is just thinking about the stimulus checks that were circulated you know, last year, right? Great headline, you know, we're putting out money into the community you know, obviously it was not nearly enough to meet need, but, you know, there was a certain amount of money that every, everybody was going to receive. And then, hey, stories started rolling in about how implementation was sort of botched and people were not getting checks or people who shouldn't be receiving checks were receive, receiving checks. All of that hinges on good implementation. And so that's why it is so important that we play the game at the federal level, not just in Congress, but with the administration as well. Um, there are existing laws that agencies have authority to work within, um, you know, broad, fair housing, you know, anti-discrimination laws, fair lending, things of that nature. And agencies will regularly update their rulemaking or guidances in the context of those laws. And part of our work as advocates is to make sure that they're doing that in a responsible way. And so there's constant work to be done in engaging, you know, the federal agencies to be more responsive to community need. And obviously over the last four years, that's been much more of a challenge, as you all can imagine. It has been much harder to engage the administration on that front. But with the new Biden administration, there's genuine hope um, that we can get back to that kind of engagement, sitting down with agencies, telling them what community need is, helping them understand um, changes that can be made within existing law to help our community. So it really is very important. And I guess to sum it all up, we talk about policy change, which is certainly important that's Congress. But when we're talking about systems change, that can only happen if Im implementation and the agencies that are acting upon it are on point with that as well. Great, thank you, Greg. Absolutely, right? It's not just about policies, but also resources and practices, right? And rules. Uh, and I'll just say, I'm a political scientist and uh, you know I do a lot of, uh, my research that I did in graduate school was on uh, social movements and political behavior. I found Congress, studies of Congress to be okay. I found studies of the bureaucracy so dry, but that's where so much of the action happens. And we saw this in this past year uh, or past two years with public charge, for example, right? That was an instance of rulemaking involving, um, you know, health and human services and other kind of federal agencies and ultimately tying back to Homeland Security, um, hugely consequential for our community. So with that, I'm gonna actually then pivot to Kathy who has a strong experience in health so Kathy, you've been very heavily involved in health policy at the national level for a while. Can you say more a little bit about your experience as an executive director of the health forum and, and maybe also later as a commissioner when you can kind of offer that perspective or it wasn't just in health that you were looking at this. Um, what, what, uh, what can people learn from your experience and those of others in terms of to how to become more effective in advocacy directly involving um, federal agencies? Thank you, Karthik. And uh, it's so nice to be with Madeline and Greg and you. Uh, good, to, good to be with longtime friends and colleagues. Thank you for having me. Um, I do have that uh, distinct advantage of seeing this from both sides of the interactions, both as an advocate as well as an appointee. Um, I do have an example that really kind of elucidates these different perspectives and positions. So um, as Karthik said, not only did I work at the Asian and Pacific Island American Health Forum, but also I was a member of President Obama's uh, second term commission. So every five years, HHS does a, uh, an HIV AIDS strategic plan. 
And in 2015, a new one was going to be released at the uh, with the CD uh, at, was going to be released. Um, the, at the health forum, we have worked with CDC for 26 continuous years, and it's continuing to this day on HIV and AIDS. So we are highly aware of the impact that the strategic plan would have and its usual lack of citations for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Um, when I first got appointed as a commissioner, I had shared with our staff that as a, an appointee, that we were told that we could request a meeting with anyone in the federal government. Didn't mean that we would get a meeting anytime soon or right away, but that it would eventually happen. So when the strategic plan was released for comment, our HIV team remembered that and asked me if I could speak with the authors to assure that key citations about Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders were included. So I asked. Uh, it took a while, um, but ultimately a 15 minute conversation did happen uh, before the close of the comment period. And we were able to make sure that another two citations were inserted. So why was this important? Well, uh, foundations who fund in, uh, at the national level and in HIV and AIDS will actually look at the strategic plan and try to align to it. And given what, how we open today's session that this level of invisibility and lack of understanding of the needs in our communities, if there was either no citations at all or only one, it would be very easy then for other stakeholders and other donors, other funders to just completely ignore us again. So it was the only hope to continue to have some attention was to really have a few citations that were very specific to Asian American state points of the Islanders. Um, so let me also talk about being an advocate. So we have the experience of how important working in coalition is. And we are a member of the Health Forum is a member of uh, NCAPO, where uh, Greg is our national director. So um, for example, except for the Trump administration, Ever since NCAPA's uh, 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 inception about 25 years ago, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander advocates have met with the Secretary of Health and Human Services. This is organized through the NCAPA Health Committee, which meets monthly and we keep tabs on everything that everybody is doing. The health forum is usually the main liaison and organizer of um, our side of the conversation and co-leads the meeting. But it is really important that the federal infrastructure understands that we on our side do have an advocacy infrastructure that is coordinated and, um, and, and well organized so that we can prioritize the asks to the department and then just keep driving towards them so that we can work our way through those things. When it comes to working with appointees, it is really important to work with them and to support their success in order for our issues to, uh, to get some traction like being available to answer questions, feeding them information or intelligence, and when necessary, providing political cover. But it's not just limited to AA and NHPI appointees. It really is important to work with, um, since, especially since there's so few AA uh, PI uh, uh, appointees, it's also important to work with those that we know of and that know our issues and that have been allies with our communities. For example, over the last four years, or, or during the Trump administration, working with career staff at HHS, it was important for us to be able to make the case to the new political appointee of the importance of the continued work from before, meaning the previous administration, and then to educate them on the successes of that partnership, and especially why it was important and why it could be of political benefit for them to continue that work. So once that appointee agreed with that work, we could continue on the same good work that we had continued that we had started under the Obama administration into the first few years of the Trump administration. So even if we don't necessarily know that they're an ally, it's still really important to work with them. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy, for so much that you highlighted, but I think this difference between career and political appointees. Also, it's so important that when we think about representation, and again, I'll drop some political science knowledge here. We talk about the difference between descriptive representation and substantive representation. Both are important. We need to have people who look like us, but you can't take it for granted. Just we've seen plenty of examples of people who look like us who don't necessarily represent our community's interests. Uh, there, you know, there's an expression when people say skin folk and kin folk, right? So that 
that's important to recognize. At the same time, also don't give up on those opportunities thinking, oh, this agency is not headed up by an Asian American or Pacific Islander. I'm not even gonna have a chance in terms of having my interests heard, my needs, the needs of my community heard. So, so vital for that. And we'll get back to that later in terms of what, you know, what, what can an advocacy and engagement agenda look like this week? What can it look like in the first 100 days and then for the rest of the year? and future years. But before we do that, this will be a slightly faster round. Um, this is almost like a game show when we will talk about different agencies and anyone can jump and, and, and grab it. So, uh, you know, hopefully we won't, we won't have a scrum here. So first is the Office of Management and Budget. You know, I know from, from the past, especially when it comes to data standards and rulemaking that OMB is important, both on the budget side, as well as other aspects of the, uh, of the federal government. So does someone want to jump first at why OMB is so important for API communities? I'll take it. Go ahead, Medley. <laughs> I'll take it. So, you know, OMB, it's the largest component of the executive office of the president. So um, it reports directly to the president. It has a wide range of executive departments and agencies that it reviews um, across the federal government. And um, it's mainly to implement the commitments and priorities of the president. And so that means an overarching uh, reach um, across all agencies to make sure that their budget and their procedures um, all align with the president's administration's um, policies. And, um, you know, I think we were talking a little bit earlier about how um, Kathy has called them sort of like the magician. If they say they'll do it, it will happen. Um, and so whenever um, OMB is taking a look at an agency's budget, they're making sure that they're actually aligned to the priorities um, of that administration um, and how they are also assessing, you know, competing funds. And so it's an incredibly influential department. Um, and so, you know, if we are able to have Nero Tandon in that role as its director, we will have a leading voice in making sure that underrepresented communities are also seen um, and valued um, when it comes time to prioritizing that with federal funds. So that's great. So, I mean, it sounds kind of like maybe a CFO position within, within a large firm, uh, maybe, right? But then I mean, how about some of the, I mean, like we know some of these OMB directors were vital for data disaggregation, for example, and even the race definitions. So either Greg or Kathy, uh, maybe jump on that. Yeah, actually, the statistician of the United States, there's an actual position called the statistician of the United States, um, operates out of OMB. So, and that person, um, it was actually held by somebody for like three decades who's since retired, but that position determines kind of what, the, what they call the federal statistical community and how they approach uh, changing data standards. Um, of course, there's certain agencies that are really important like census and each, each individual agency, but the statistician of the United States based in the OMB is um, also very influential. Yeah, I would say in addition to that with data disaggregation, many of you in the audience know that this is an issue that we have as a community have been fighting for for decades. And the key here is that if we can get better data on our communities from the federal government and the programs that they run, we can actually make better arguments for, the, for increased need, increased investment and all of the above. There was some significant progress made under the Obama administration in a number of different agencies, and it looked like it was going to move through OMB towards a national data standard across all agencies. And we simply ran out of time as far as the Obama administration. Um, obviously, that work ground to a halt um, under the Trump administration, but our hope and our belief is that uh, President Biden um, will take a serious look at this, and his OMB and his agencies will take to heart the feedback of the community that we've been giving and continue to give about the importance of this. And for those who don't know about it, it's simply saying, look, we all know Asian American Pacific Islander is a catch-all term that does not properly represent the actual diversity of our communities. We have Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, Southeast Asians that are underrepresented and not accounted for when the broader American public talks about the quote unquote Asian American community. And we have to do more to try to uplift those stories so that decision makers and policy makers um, can make more informed decisions about the policy laws and rulemaking that they make. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, next is gonna be uh, US trade representatives. I will admit, I did not know what the US trade representative uh, does until a few months ago. So someone wanna grab that? 
I mean, I guess I will. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are know, the policy. Okay, you did say policy wonk slash nerd at some point. Right? That's fair. That's fair. Yeah. So the USTR and all, and full disclosure, and Kappa typically does not do uh, foreign policy, trade policy issues, but we do focus heavily on domestic policy issues that impact our community. And I think the simple truth is that we all know that. Our, our world has become so globalized that things that happen with, it, with trade agreements or other things that are happening in the world impact us here at home. Certainly the COVID-19 pandemic has really wrought real destruction on the economies of everybody around the world. And as we start to rebuild that um, and start to re-examine trade agreements and sort of how we interact with our partner countries around the world, it's important for our communities to be thought about in this way. The USTR will help negotiate trade deals that could impact American, well, certainly would impact American workers and could impact Asian American, you know, small businesses in terms of supply chains and all of that. And so it is sort of this indirect effect, but it is absolutely real. And again, given the context of COVID-19 and the rebuilding that needs to happen, it's important for us to make sure that USTR is aware of our issues. And that's partly why Catherine Tai being nominated there is, is so exciting. And as a former Hill staffer, as Karthik mentioned, I think it's great. Um, I, I don't know her personally, but I know that her reputation certainly preceded her on the Hill. So, you know, I think you have to sort of do that one jump and not the immediate connection of why USCR is important to the community. Excellent. Natalie, if go ahead. Just, yeah, if I yeah. could just add, I mean, there are definitely, you know, qualified Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders who can do these jobs. And I think, you know, also, we might not know all of them, and that's why we look to the community to help us in, in, in trying to aggregate that you know, talent pool. Um, and that's why NCAPA and APEX put together a resume bank to encourage the, the community to submit their resumes for the Biden administration as we move those resumes forward over to the presidential personnel. So, you know, Catherine ties an example of someone that you might not think of as USTR off the top of your head, you know, because maybe you don't know um, the issues, but she's a ways and means expert, having worked in it as a legislative staffer for so long on that committee, she's just well versed in the actual work. And I think, again, this is a part of why we think of leadership, Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders can have that knowledge and still be working on things that may not necessarily be in um, what you consider our, our key issues. And so that leadership yeah. change is also something that we need to mentally overcome. Absolutely, right? So it's not just what our issues are, but fundamentally inclusion means seeing us in all roles in all places potentially, right? Um, okay, next is Department of Justice. Now, first of all, Department of Justice, you know, a lot of people were paying attention to Mary Garland's confirmation, but we have Anita Gupta as an associate uh, uh, attorney general. This is one thing I'll just say, you'll see me a, a little bit, maybe a little bit informal here. Associate, deputy, like assistant, like what do all these things mean? Okay, so, but let's do DOJ. Associate, attorney, Department of Justice in general, and then what's the difference between a deputy and an associate? Do, do these titles matter? So I can take another crack at this one. DOJ is probably one of the most important agencies in our time, given everything that's happened. And, I, and what I mean by that is, I believe that the API community has a responsibility to show up for other communities and also voice when our communities are being impacted um, by racism, by violence, even by state violence that's sometimes perpetrated by agencies under the DOJ, right? And our job, our responsibility is to advocate for change. And whether it's police reform, whether it's defund the police and what that conversation brings to the table, um, having community members in positions of influence at DOJ will be incredibly important. I don't know if you all saw, but there have been a, a recent few examples of our community members um, being killed by members of the police force. Um, you know, th these are tragedies and these are things that are not receiving mainstream media attention. And we certainly still have a responsibility to advocate for our black and brown brothers and sisters who are being impacted by police violence you know, at a far greater rate than we are. But DOJ is not just police violence. I mean, that is sort of the topic du jour and it's certainly important, but it also deals with the FBI and the profiling of Asian American scientists. It deals with the profiling of South Asian communities as it relates to perceived connections ter to terrorism. These are all things that are having legitimate impacts on millions of Asian Americans' lives. And it's our job to make sure that the DOJ 
not only has people that are willing to listen, but if they have people that aren't necessarily willing to listen, that we demand that we have a seat at the table so that they, so that they do. Um, so there's a lot more we could talk about, but I think the key here as far as position title and deputy direct, you know, attorney general versus associate is, you know, there's lots of different divisions within DOJ and responsibilities are kind of split up based on that. The key here for me is just that having Vanita Gupta there is a huge step forward because of her track record, her pedigree, you know, the work that she's done with the leadership conference. Um, it gives it gives me real hope that there can be some real uh, culture change at DOJ in terms of how they approach some of these questions about policing, about profiling of our communities and the like. So just a quick couple of things, uh, right? I mean, I, I think you might have mentioned it, right? But certainly hate crimes, you know, as it involves federal federal hate crimes, DOJ would fall under that. I think it, even discrimination and all other areas like education, healthcare, all of those, I think fall under DOJ, is that is that right? I just wanna make sure. I it's believe well, under, under HHS, there is a separate office of, for civil mm -hmm. rights in HHS, so you can file that way. But yeah, the coordination has to happen with DOJ at some point. Right, enforcement right. of the laws will run through DOJ, generally speaking. Okay, so this is a, the department itself is very important and uh, the particular role of uh, Gupta and her nominated role is very important. Uh, so please pay attention to that. You know, as those confirmation hearings come up, we have to get very savvy on this uh, really quickly. Okay, next is labor, Department of Labor. Um, so we have Julie Sue as an appointee there. Uh, does anyone want to take a crack at, at, at labor? Um, maybe Madeline, I'll, I'll come, come to you first. Uh, I, I know Greg's always going to be ready, so. Uh, but I'm going to see if I can toss one over to you. Sure. I mean, I think it's been important for us because um, you know, we were um, in the beginning advocating for Ms. Sue um, for the secretary role. Um, you know, the administration chose um, instead uh, Mr. Walsh. And, uh, you know, having Ms. Sue in the deputy role is uh, basically um, a voice for us. And, you know, she is clearly uh, well qualified for uh, the position, having served as a labor commissioner um, in California. And so um, her voice will be um, one that will be at the table. Um, I think it's also important to know, too, that, um, you know, the chief of staff for Mr. Walsh is Asian American. And I think um, it's equally important that sometimes the principals, although, you know, more publicly recognized, that the people who work in support of those principles are important as well. And so understanding that um, the day-to-day -day action that um, someone like a chief of staff would have in an agency who talks directly to the White House liaison in terms of political appointment hires um, is also critical as we start to you know, continue to push for representation um, of uh, our community in the various agencies. Great, thank you, Madeline. Um, I'll just add one quick thing about Julie Sue being, um, you know, being in California, you know, so she was not only labor commissioner, I mean, she is the labor secretary of California right now, and she cut her teeth and really made a big name for herself and got a MacArthur Award based on her pioneering work when it came to garment workers, uh, a lot of them uh, Asian American, right, uh, as well as others, um, and is just such a consistently been such a strong champion for her community. She used to be in what is now um, Advancing Justice LA, but back then the Legal Center. So, um, you know, definitely someone who has been a champion for so long, and especially for some of the most disadvantaged members of our community. So I really hope that people get to know and appreciate her candidacy and really pay the kind of attention that it will deserve. Because it seems like, I mean, it's interesting, many of these people of color, there's start questions now coming up in the, in the Senate. Um, and you know, that's something we'll talk about later in terms of what the advocacy agenda um, looks like. Of course, for anyone who's a C3, make sure you're following your C3 protocols when we talk about advocacy. Um, next is CFPB, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Now, this is another agency that most people might not know what it does. So does someone wanna take a, a stab at CFPB? I always want to make space for my colleagues, but I'm happy to take this. <laughs> Go ahead, Greg. So the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was created following the 2009 financial crisis that all of us lived through, right? The banking system collapsed. 
there was catastrophic job loss and economic harm done to many, to everybody, especially communities of color. And there was a recognition by Congress that there needed to be a stronger cop on the beat to, to regulate consumer protection laws. Um, and so this agency was created, it was the brainchild of Senator Elizabeth Warren, along with uh, Congressman Barney Frank and Chris, uh, Senator Chris Dodd, and essentially created a completely new agency, completely new to basically take over all of the consumer protection laws um, that are currently on the books and basically center American consumers first. And so they regulate the mortgage markets, credit cards, uh, other lenders, um, and all sort of financial products. And their job is to make sure that discrimination doesn't occur and they go after unscrupulous lenders and, and punish them and you know, put them out of business if they need to. And so the key here is that one of the, when we talk about who we are, and you know, I, was on, you know, I was raging earlier about the fact that we were excluded from a lot of the narratives in this, the 2009 financial crisis impacted Asian Americans far more than we realized. And it goes back to data disaggregation because everybody assumed that Asian Americans as a whole were less impacted because we have a good number of affluent Asian Americans that were able to navigate the crisis. If you go to Minnesota and the Hmong American community out there, they actually found that the rate of predatory lenders sort of targeting that community was on par with black and brown communities as well. And so having um, Asian American representation at the CFPB, having, a, having people who understand the community experience is crucial because these are the, this is the agency that's going to review the laws that currently exist, determine are they protecting communities enough? You know, are they culturally and linguistically you know, sensitive? Are we doing everything we can to put information out to these communities so that they are aware that these protections exist for them? Um, so there's a whole host of sort of this, this ripple effect of kind of impact that we can have if the CFPB really recenters communities of color in a more meaningful way. Great, thank you, Greg. I'll also add, for example, when it comes to uh, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander elders, right? That AARP has been uh, emphasizing that for a while, right? In terms of the financial vulnerability of our elder communities and 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 their um, vulnerability, right, to scams and other kinds of um, fraud. So that's something uh, to keep in mind as well. Uh, next, we have the Surgeon General. So I'm going to look over to Kathy uh, and. Uh, who is a Surgeon General and kind of how does that fit into, I mean, normally we think of Health and Human Services, but it is an office of the Surgeon General. It's an office in and of itself, correct? Right. So Surgeon General is not a cabinet appointment level because like you said, uh, is uh, they work um, within the Department of Health and Human Services. But in many ways, um, it, uh, the Surgeon General's position is considered the nation's physician, uh, the nation's doctor. And so they're the platform to be able to communicate with a, the American public about the health of the American public is really, really important. And various Surgeon Generals through the decades and through various administrations have taken up certain key issues and then really promote them in order to make change within the country. So in the previous, in uh, uh, President Obama's administration, Dr. Vivek Murthy did serve as a Surgeon General. And uh, in that capacity, we worked very, at the health forum, we worked very, very closely with him. He was also the co-chair of WIAPI and the President's Advisory Commission. So I was able to work with him in that capacity as well. Um, so he has been nominated for Surgeon General under President Biden. Um, when he had to go through Senate confirmation the first time under President uh, Obama, it did not go so smoothly. So there may be some challenges that Dr. Murthy will experience this time as well. And it'll be really important just with all of the nominees that, that we wanna support. It'll be really, really important that communities come out and support these, the nominations that are really important to us. Um, uh, Dr. Murthy is very conscious of health equity and especially for all communities of color and um, has also been um, very vocal about a lot of different issues, whether it be gun violence, and that was the issue that was kind of holding him up in Senate confirmation. Um, he already has taken a very, very strong role in working with then President-elect Biden on uh, President Biden's uh, COVID task force. Uh, and he will, uh, Dr. Murthy, uh, when, if he is uh, confirmed, when he is confirmed, will continue to play a really, really important role in that as well, since we're really still dealing with an unprecedented uh, pandemic. Well, so while we're at, with you, Kathy, can you just talk about what a kind of um, engagement and advocacy agenda in HHS could look like, you know, yeah, with Javier Becerra, 
he is not Asian American, but you know, understands our community. I believe he was part of KPAC at some point, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Um, uh, Javier Becerra's uh, nomination to HHS is really, really important. And it's, again, really, really important that we support his nomination. He was a leading member of KPAC, uh, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. And now, as the Attorney General of California, he really has led a number of lawsuits defending the Affordable Care Act, as well as defending immigrant rights against the Trump administration. So his familiarity with uh, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders coming from California, which is the largest population, at largest uh, state population of our communities, um, it, it will be really important to have him um, in, in that position, that secretary's position. And that position, the secretary's position, along with the Surgeon General's position together can really do a lot of uh, a really good work. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Next, um, so we're just gonna move a little bit quicker than the rest that we have. Office of Personnel Management um, just announced uh, recently that Kieran Ahuja, who used to be the director of uh, the White House Initiative on APIs, has been nominated for that. Is this a position requiring Senate confirmation? Do we know? I'm not sure it does. Okay, well, Greg, I thought you would know the answer. So disappointed, Greg. I'm a little disappointed too, sorry. I just don't want to give the wrong answer. You know how it is. <laughs> no worries, we'll come back to you. Okay, so. While we then go, so but anyway, that's another major significant appointment. If we say that personnel is policy, you know, it doesn't get, you know, that's one of the, it's so important to have a champion, not only for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but a champion for racial equity in such an important role as the director of, um, of the Office of uh, Personnel Management. Um, next, I'm gonna ask about the Interior Department. So the Interior Department, Deb Howland, she is also starting to, uh, get some uh, some noise in terms of uh, her um, her confirmation. Uh, she would make history, uh, right, as the first, I believe, Native American period, not just Native American woman uh, and woman of color to head interior. Uh, why is the interior department important for our communities, Kathy? And then why should we be thinking about, to the, again, in our C3 uh, role in advocacy, uh, thinking of Holland as someone um, worth supporting. So, you know, just as you said, in all those reasons of, of being an historic appointment uh, and being in solidarity with the Native American community is super important. Uh, also, Representative Holland um, uh, caucused with the Congressional Tri Caucus, which is the KPAC, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, being only one of two uh, Native American members in the House. So she uh, is familiar with a lot of our issues and uh, worked across all communities of color. So those are really, really important as well. But even more directly for our communities, the Department of Interior, DOI, has jurisdiction over all the US affiliated Pacific jurisdictions, but also the Caribbean territories and, 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 and locations, but um, in particular, all the Pacific jurisdictions, including the territories and the Kofa nations. Um, the nature of the relationship and especially the allocation of funding are really critical issues. And the secretary's office oversees all of that. In addition to that, for the National Park Service, as well as for historic preservation, there are many sites that our communities have uh, rallied around and worked on. For me personally, it's Angel Island Immigration Station, um, that all of that is also under uh, uh, Department of Interior. Great, thank you, Kathy. And I believe uh, there was a report that was done a few years ago, right, in terms of national historic landmarks and parks and all, and, and there's severe underrepresentation for Asian American, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander sites uh, and interior plays a very important role there, right? Yeah, so like the rest of the, the main maintenance of, uh, there's only like three, three existing uh, historic Japan towns uh, that remain uh, the the uh, maintenance of different uh, ethnic communities um, like Chinatowns, uh, that all of that would go under historic preservation under our DOI. Great. Okay, so now we have, and thank you, Greg, for confirming that uh, Huja's position uh, does require Senate confirmation. So, um, so please um, pay attention to that. We have a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so this is gonna be fast. Um, one, I believe Madeline already talked through a little bit uh, you know, please walk us through the application process and any special tips in terms of getting picked. Someone had already asked, also asked, you know, if they had submitted their thing to the resume bank, 
you know, will they ever hear back? And like, what's the kind of process? I mean, and is now the only time window? Could this happen later in terms of personnel? So uh, Greg and Madeline, maybe either of you could, could answer that. Well, we have webinars up on um, the APEX website that allows you to sort of see some Q&A on the process. So I, I highly recommend taking a look at um, those webinars to answer some questions, um, one of them being sort of a 101 on a political appointments um, from someone who used to work at PPO. So um, take a look at that. Um, in regards to the resume bank, um, we have um, a process to which um, NCAPA leads the you know, reviews of those resumes. And so, um, Greg, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to answer those questions. Sure. Thanks, Madeline. And appreciate the question. Um, I think taking a step back, we have to remember that President Biden showed up on day one and had an enormous mess on his hands. He's also trying to staff up his administration, and that simply takes time in terms of vetting individuals. And so for those who have submitted their resumes to the NCAP Apex Resume Bank, um, we have been submitting them on a rolling basis um, to the administration, uh, originally to the, pre uh, to the transition team before President Biden officially got sworn in. Um, and we continue to engage with the uh, Presidential Personnel Office, PPO, which is in charge of placing appointments um, to ensure that not only the names that we have been that have been submitted to the resume bank are considered, but also any community members um, be considered for various appointments. And so rest assured, we're gonna continue that work. Those conversations continue. And if you haven't heard back from the administration, I would not necessarily give up hope because there are thousands of, of appointments that need to be filled. And there are only so many people who are vetting them. Obviously they're trying to staff up. So uh, my experience has been that it oftentimes can take months, um, even, even longer sometimes before all appointments are fully filled in a new administration. So bear with us and trust that again, we are gonna to continue to make as much noise as we can um, with PPO to make sure that our communities are represented in those appointments. Great, okay, so I'm gonna um, uh, ask one more, uh, that's I think more kind of general process. If you're hired to be an appointee, are you expected to already know the priorities of the administration or is this something you learn on the job? So maybe Madeline? Kick it over to you on that one. Sure, I would say like they, you know, go through the process of, you know, I will say this because I have a spouse who is in the administration um, as a political appointee is that, you know, they're looking for alignment of values. They're looking for alignment of, you know, do you believe in, you know, these values as we have set as um, priorities for this administration. And so, you know, that is a part of the, you know, interview process of the matchmaking that you would see in any interview. And so um, I don't believe you have to know everything. You just need to know exactly if the agency you're working in, um, you know, what the priorities will be. The Biden administration has been pretty transparent in terms of what they see as their top priorities for this administration. And so um, understanding um, that and how it might connect with your work um, in those different agencies will also um, be an advantage um, when you go through the interview process. Great. Let me also say oh, ahead, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the whole process, so getting the interview is one thing, and you know, you want to prepare for any interview you're going to have, right, whether it was a job or anything like that, but the whole appointment process is, um, is, is uh, quite invasive. I don't know what, what else to say. I mean, you have to basically fill out forms about everything in your life, you know, you have to not only talk about everything that you've ever done, you have to do financial disclosures, uh, you have to do FBI clearances. I mean, it is a whole process. So it, you know, it is something to think about that if, you know, there is going to be this whole uh, uh, basically investigative portion of becoming an appointee that you also will have to be part of. Great. Okay. So a few couple, a couple of questions here I'll ask quickly. One was about uh, young people. How do we get um, API youth um, kind of more engaged in this, in, you know, in awareness and engagement in this, in this process. Are there any organizations um, that, uh, you know, that we could turn to that could get more youth engagement and awareness on this? So I'll chime in, you know, so APAX last year, we started a high school program um, to basically help um, put together a group of uh, people from um, the territories across the country to meet, you know, unfortunately it was virtually, um, to learn about the legislative process. What does it mean um, to you know, be a member of Congress? How do you work a bill? 
Um, and then also we had speakers on who could talk about what the difference is um, when it comes to your local and state government. And so, um, you know, we will be announcing shortly our next uh, application deadline for that cohort. Um, and so it's a great opportunity to learn more about others' experiences, like what does it mean to live in a territory versus living um, in a, on the continental US. So I think it is definitely an opportunity for us to do that um, in the legislative public policy way. And we also have paid congressional internships. Um, so I think um, with APEX, uh, we are highly uh, encourage um, our youth to take a look at our programs. Okay, so I see a couple of questions about that are kind of advocacy related. One is, is there any kind of coordination happening say among different uh, Asian American Pacific Islander communities, but then also other uh, progressive groups or other um, groups, you know, representing other communities of, of interest. So um, any uh, guidance on that, if, you know, on the community advocacy for particular positions, including those already existing, but more to be named later. Greg, do you wanna maybe take that? Yeah, I mean, I would say there's a flurry of activity certainly within the Beltway um, because many organizations in the Beltway understand sort of the importance of getting these appointments and people that sort of share values with, with the community. And so, you know, there's been a number of efforts sort of organized around various appointment candidates. And so I imagine that work continues, but more broadly speaking, um, I think there was some, you know, there was a lot of chatter on social media around Nera Tandon um, and then likely, you know, there's conversations happening on a regular basis about organizing similar efforts for other uh, candidates who have been uh, nominated for appointment. And so I think part of the challenge here is that there is a, there's community education that needs to occur, but then there's also the, how do you best reach the senators who are ultimately responsible for making the, the final determination, right? And so I think there's certainly more we can do, but certainly within the DC sort of bubble, there's lots of activity going on. So, okay, so let me just dig a little bit deeper. Uh, so this will be the question of, you know, what if people are organizing this week and next week, I don't know, maybe there's gonna be another week, right, of uh, Senate confirmations, how how can they, uh, is, is there an API organization that is coordinating all of this uh, Senate confirmation um, advocacy work? So I would say that in Kappa to a certain extent is, and I'll, in full disclosure, a lot of, sometimes the challenge with the coalition and moving quickly is that there's lots of opinions on a given candidate. And so I have a responsibility to make sure that all of our members have an opportunity to weigh in before we actually move. And so, as I mentioned, there've been a number of other instances led by national organizations around other API candidates um, that I would definitely wanna highlight. And I can share more information after the fact that presumably we can get out to all the participants, but, you know, part of NCAPA's role is to make sure we're pushing this conversation. And so, you know, we have been in touch with the administration, pushing them on greater inclusion. And I think it's a good opportunity to point out that to date, there have been no Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander appointees. And that is a massive blind spot. Wow. That is something that we as a community, if we are serious about racial equity, you know, have to get behind and say, this is unacceptable. You know, I think we have to start challenging this notion that Asian American, when we say API, it's someone who looks like me right? Like there's so much more diversity there and we have to challenge decision makers to be better on this. So I, I would I would say that and uh, definitely we'll make sure more resources get out as far as ways to plug in. Wow, well, that's powerful. And I, you know, as someone who follows data in all sorts of ways, I did not really, I mean, it makes sense to me, but that's, wow. You appointed something that I think is something that the movement needs to look at and interrogate. Like we were so up in arms saying that you don't have an API, but really a lot of the focus was on Asian American and not lifting up the fact that there's never been an NH or PI um, cabinet appointment like that. Wow, okay, we definitely need to do better in terms of our awareness and advocacy as a community. A couple of questions have come up. People want to uh, ask about grassroots and leaders at the grassroots level and in various states. Is there a certain kind of pedigree or set of checklists and federal agencies and connections that you need? How can we make sure that we have folks that have grassroots expertise and leadership that they've built uh, can be useful 
uh, when it comes to um, administrative appointments at the federal level. Is there maybe an inspiring example that folks know of? I mean, we get we give an example of Julie Sue, but now she's labor secretary in California. I mean, she already came up quite a ways. But if not at that very high level, are there other levels in which or examples where you have seen folks? I mean, I think for example, Kieran Ahuja, when she got uh, appointed, she was at NAPOF right before that, um, uh, which is the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, right? Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't know if folks want to highlight some examples of, yes, you know, there are ways if you're really strong, fierce, amazing grassroots organizer or leader, uh, there are ways to get plugged into um, public service in DC. I don't know, Kathy, I mean, being on the commission and also just seeing folks, you know, who are just so powerful uh, when it comes to health advocacy across the United States. I mean, I mean, what would you, what advice would you give? I think you know for the the commission is a perfect example that um, you know folks were uh, you know to twenty different positions from all over the country, um, and at the same time you know as I was saying the the um, the confirmation process even if you don't have to get, get Senate confirmed but the whole application process and then getting appointed is very invasive and not everybody makes it through that process. I just want to be honest mm -hmm. about that, right? So it is important that if you're interested that you express your interest and you get your packages into in Kappa and Apex, but that doesn't mean that that's gonna take care of it. There really is this whole uh, very uh, thorough review process and not everyone makes it. So, um, you know, so I think we definitely wanna support people from the grassroots, we definitely wanna support people to apply. And um, there are only 4,000 spots. I mean, there's not that many spots and think of how many people who might be interested. So I think it's also for us to continue to think about how important grassroots organizing and advocacy is because that kind of work in partnership with appointees, whether they be APR or not, is really critical and that's how a lot of it's gonna get done. Great, well, I we could, are, you know, there's so many more questions here, but go ahead, Madeline. Yeah, if I could just add, I mean, Secretary Mineta highly encourages people to join boards and commissions um, at their localities because it does give you a lot of you know, gravitas from working in those commissions to you know, transfer that to other commissions on a national level. And so a lot of those times, you, know, you go through a very similar process. You don't have to run for office. You are a subject matter expert already. I think it's um, important to um, take a look at, um, you know, we also have a, a, a webinar series on boards and commissions on the APEX website. And so, um, Boards and commissions in itself is also a great way to start within your state that also gives you um, an opportunity in the future. And this NCAPA APEX resume bank is gonna run for at least a year because we know it's gonna take time for those appointments to be made. And also there will be a second wave. People will burn out, people will want to move on. Um, and so there'll be people who need, they need to keep filling the pipeline and we, and we wanna be that pipeline. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say as someone who's the chair of the California Commission on uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Affairs, there are so many different state commissions. And, and yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking exclusively about the federal government, federal appointments, but please do uh, pay attention to what's going on in various states and even advocate for that. One final question that came up, and there's so many more left unanswered, but uh, is WIAPI going to be reconstituted and then under what agency is it going to be? Do we have any sense of what that's going to be, Greg? So I can take the first crack at this. So that is actually, we just had a conversation amongst our GAPA members about how we want to strategize around this. Um, our belief is that the White House certainly has interest in doing this. Um, however, like I mentioned, they're still staffing up key parts of their kind of internal apparatus. And so I would be, I, I believe that the initiative will be stood up again. I think it gives us a unique opportunity as a community to make recommendations as to potential changes we'd like to see um, with the initiative and its constitution. And so that conversation continues with the NCAPA members um, and we intend to submit those recommendations in, in the near term. So it is possible that it's flexible, that it's been under in education and commerce before, but it could go under justice or labor, is that right? I think it's, it's been in HHS too, yeah, the first HHS. one. Okay. Yes. Oftentimes it's a function of where funding is available, right? Because if we can't fund the initiative, it's not gonna have much ability to do what we hope it can. And so I think there's a lot of 
internal discussion with the administration as to where it makes sense, where they can find funding. But that's incumbent on us to make sure we make clear that it's a priority that it exists and that it have funding. Um, because if we say nothing, they'll just place it and say, we check the box. Yeah. Okay, so we're at time. I'm gonna ask one final round. You know, this has been an amazing nerd out session in so many ways. Uh, I've learned so much that probably I ever wanted to know about, about the executive branch and all these agencies. Now, and, and all joking aside, this has been amazing. And we've seen so many people writing in Q&A and in the chat, they found this so useful. Um, so just looking ahead, you know, and especially in a C3 capacity, if there are organizations throughout the country that want to be engaged, I'll start with you, Madeline, for this week. This week or next week with these confirmation hearings going on, what can they do in their C3 capacity to make a difference? Um, you know, if they're willing to write letters of support um, of our API, our Asian American um, nominees, I would encourage that, especially to the senators who are overseeing their, the committees um, that are handling the confirmations. Um, and if you live in Texas, Ohio, you know, those are, those are critical states um, because those are the senators who are a part of those committees. So um, I highly encourage that. Great. And then how about beyond these next few weeks? So thinking about the first 100 day agenda, right? Um, what would your recommendation be for what effective advocacy looks like? Yeah. I would say again, the last four years, we haven't had this opportunity to, to engage with the administration, but that changed. And with all of these appointments, it really is picking our dancing partner. And I'd much rather have someone in a position of power at an agency who has the political analysis, has the community analysis that aligns with ours than someone who doesn't, because you only get so many bites at the apple with these secretaries and higher ups. Um, if that meeting is spent doing basic education about our community, we've got a lot more ground to cover. And so if we have someone already in place who understands that on some level, it, it's a game, it's a potential game changer. It gives us a real chance to move policy change, systems change that we've been aiming for for decades. So I would say, you know, everybody should stay plugged into this. And once confirmations are done, once agencies are stood up and constituted more formally, um, the real work begins. Great, and then finally, I'm gonna go to Kathy thinking about the long haul, which in DC feels like, you know, maybe it's just the rest of this year, but just thinking about the next four years, Kathy, and your experience in, in you know, in, in, in various ways over the years, what would your advice to organizations throughout the country, what, what would you say to them if they want to make sure that they continue to engage with, um, with the executive branch to have influence? It's relationship building. Uh, you know, in DC, a lot of it is relationship building. And so continue to get to know appointees. Uh, if you're in town, introduce them around to people because, you know, especially if they're not from DC, they will need to kind of create their own community. If they are in DC, they're probably already part of a whole network of appointees who know each other. And, and it really is a federal ecosystem. And so you can um, kind of think about your advocacy around this whole ecosystem around there's, um, you know, federal uh, uh, employee groups and that kind of stuff, but also appointee uh, uh, alumni associations. Um, and then also really provide them with the background that they're going to need. Stories. Stories are so valuable. If there are stories that have been fully vetted from the communities that you serve about a particular issue, that those are going to be the most helpful. Now, this is true of members of Congress as well as appointees to really make the case for the issues that they have. And I also have been... Um, uh, um, asked to really continue to ask everyone to support uh, Representative uh, Deb Hallen's uh, nomination. It really is so historic and our um, ability to be in solidarity with the Native American community is so important. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Greg. Uh, this has been great. This was uh, what we hope is the first of a series of community learning sessions. Um, we've seen so much interest throughout the country some of these questions, you know, for folks in DC, they are like, oh, this is old hat. But, you know, I think for so many of us that, that are in uh, states, metros, localities, and seeing, I mean, we saw, Greg, I think you and others have said, what the last, what we see what happens when a federal government doesn't work for the people. Uh, and we need to make sure that in part of that repair, but also transformation, right, in terms of transforming um, what the federal government and federal agencies can do uh, to help our communities, we need to be engaged and involved. So really uh, grateful for all of your leadership. 
uh, and uh, hoping to do uh, more of these with, uh, I'll say on behalf of API Data, with APAX and NCAPA to really amp up the policy sophistication of our community. I think what we saw in this last election is, or in the last two elections, 2018 and 2020, the power of the vote of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I think the next level is the kind of inside, outside, kind of knowing it's not just when you visit DC, it's not just visit your member of Congress, think about these federal agencies. And, and it's not just about the visits, the relationship building and the rulemaking process. There's so much uh, still to do. Um, and really um, all of the coalition partners that are part of NCAPA, just so grateful to you, Greg, and everyone else, just an incredible coalition and excited about what uh, we'll all do together collectively uh, in the months and years to come. So thank you everyone and uh, more soon. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you.